Today's topic is a very uh, relevant topic for every one of us. Is about uh, ensuring that always Christ is our security. Now, so many people of this world, in fact, almost everybody in this world, have some kind of insecurity. Unfortunately, even Christians have insecurities about so many matters, about relationships, about jobs, about the future, about the very life. And insecurity leads to anxiety and sometimes even depression. But the good news for us is when Christ is our security, we will not be shaken. It's very important that we understand He must be our security, our hope, our anchor. Now, before, the, uh, before Moses went to be with the Lord, and before the Israelites entered the land of Canaan, the book of Deuteronomy is written, was written primarily, uh, Moses repeating the law to the Israelites. Deuteronomy means repetition of the law. And whatever commandments God gave him at Mount Horeb, Sinai, he repeated them. Also, God added some more commandments at Moab. And he gives them the commandments, reminds them about it. And before he departs from this world, he blesses every tribe of Israel. 33rd chapter of Deuteronomy, the whole chapter is about blessings he gave to every tribe of Israel by name, specific blessings. And the blessing to Benjamin, the youngest of the children of uh, Isaac, of Israel, is recorded in 33rd chapter of Deuteronomy, verse 12. Let the beloved of the Lord rest secure in him, for he shields him all day long. The one whom the Lord loves rests between his shoulders. A, a blessing to Benjamin. Resting between shoulders means the Lord holding him close to his chest. Like a mother holding the baby close to the chest, rest between his shoulders. Let the beloved Lord rest secure in him. Now, Benjamin was the youngest of the twelve children. Youngest. Younger brother of Joseph. And being youngest, he might have been intimidated by the elder brothers. And the elder brother actually intimidated Joseph also. Joseph was elder to Benjamin, born to Rachel. And uh, when Benjamin was born, his mother died. Rachel died at, at when Benjamin was born. You can you imagine a child, normally for children, the mother is a security. Normally every child, mother is very special. Mother's love is very special. And almost every child has security upon the mother when they a small child. And when the child is held by the mother close to her chest, the child is so secure, not worried about who's around him and where the mother takes him, no worry at all, secure. And Benjamin didn't have a mother and he was the youngest of the 12 children of Israel and he must have had insecurity. And the Lord reassures him a blessing through Moses to Benjamin. Let the blood of the Lord rest secure in him for he shields him all day long. All day long God protects and the one whom the Lord loves rests between his shoulders. How wonderful to know that. That when he uh, ensured that Christ is a security and remains a security, we'll be secure in him. We won't be shaken by anything what happens around us. Now, as the Benjamin is concerned, later on you find in the book of Micah, in chapter 5, verse 2, Micah writes about how the Messiah will be born in Bethlehem. In Bethlehem. That's the only place in the whole Bible where before Christ came into the world, before the New Testament, Old Testament talks about where the Messiah will be born, in Bethlehem. And that's verse 2 of Micah chapter 5. Verse 5 says, He will be their peace. Peace is not a state of mind. It's not an absence of problems. It is, a, it is actually a person. He's, he's Jesus. And the previous verse says about people who rece receive this amazing benefit of salvation through Christ, they will live securely. They will live securely for He will be their peace. When He is our peace, we will be secure in Him. Without Him, no security. We are insecure about so many matters around us, like I said, about relationships, about losing the love of our friends and relatives. And uh, we're very jittery about relationships, insecurity about the job, insecurity about career, insecurity about the future, most everything, we are insecurity. But when we put our trust in Him, we will not be put to shame. 
be to come under the umbrella of God and choose to come under his umbrella. Look at the uh, 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 Gospel of Luke 13.34. The Lord says, O Jerusalem, you kill the prophets and stone those sent to you. How often I have learned to gather the children together, I have learned to gather the children together, as a hen gather the chicks under her wings. But you are not willing. You are not willing to come under my wings. Like a hen gather chicks under her wings. I want you to come under my protection. Under my wings, so to speak. Wings of God. God is in our wings. It's only a figure of speech for us to understand protection. How long, how often long gather children together? As a hen gather chicks under her wings. When, when look at a hen with chicks under the wings, the chicks are so secure under the wings of the mother. God said, I long to come, for you to come under my wings, but you are not willing. What does it mean? You must be willing to come under the protection of God. Choose to be under his protection, not to move out of his will and his comfort, his encouragement, and which means basically we live by every word that he speaks to us today. Very often the Bible read about how God talks about relationship with his children in the context of a bird looking after the young ones. Uh, Luke 13, 34, an example. Hen gathering chicks under wings, but you're not willing to come under my wings. You want to go your own way. Wander here and there. Wandering from the faith. Getting hurt in the world and then coming back crying to me. Why do you always remain in me? That's what God says. Many often find this thing about a bird and the young one under the wings. For example, uh, in Psalm 91, what a wonderful psalm that is. And that psalm is addressed to, he who dwells in the shelter of the Most High. Who, who is sacred by the Most High. That's the Old Testament time. Today, that promise is for us. Everything in Psalm 91 is applicable to us today. In Christ, every promise is applicable to us. It's relevant to us. But those days, that was only for people who dwell in the shelter of the Most High. Who dwell in the secret of the Most High. Who abide the shadow of the Almighty. Shadow means what? Intimately close to God. In the shadow of somebody, always walking with him or walking with her, is shadow of somebody. And that promise is for, for everybody in the Old Testament who are under his wings, under his shadow, well, the secret by the Most High. And verse 4 says, Psalm 91 verse 4, His faithful and is rampant, and under his wings we'll find refuge. Under his wings we find refuge, security. There's Psalm 91 verse 4. Under his wings means God's wings. God doesn't have wings, physical wings. But basically it means for us to understand protection, protection. Then we also read in Psalm 63, verse 6, it says, uh, verse 7 actually, uh, verse 7. Because you are my help, I sing in the shadow of your wings. Who writes that? David. David says, because you are my help, I sing in the shadow of your wings. Under your wings, under your shelter, under your refuge, I sing because I am secure, I am protected. So, hen, the bird under, under the wings, Psalm 91 verse 4, Psalm 63 verse 7, and then you also find, uh, before the Lord God gave the commandments to Israelites through Moses, he asked them a question whether they would obey him or not. Moses went to the Mount of Horeb to worship God. Because before he went to Egypt, God told him, when you bring my people out, you shall worship me on this mountain. Moses went to the mountain to worship God. God sends him back with the message to the Israelites. Exodus 19, chapter 4, 5, and 6. You yourself know what I did to Egypt, how I carried you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. I carried eagle's wings and brought you to myself. Now, if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, out of all the nations will be treasured my, my treasured possession. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of peace and a holy nation. It reminds them how they are brought from Egypt to the land of Canaan on eagle's wings. Eagle flies very, very high. Very, very high it flies. And the story about eagles, the true story about, the main thing we study about the eagle, eagle's uh, life and how 
eagle uh, uh, lives in this world. A lot of things to learn from an eagle. And uh, according to uh, many uh, uh, bird watchers, bird experts, when an eagle flies, what happens is sometimes these uh, other birds, like crows or whatever, sit on top of the eagle on the back and keep on poking the eagle. And an eagle will not respond. Eagle will just go higher and higher and higher. It won't react to the irritation of the other birds. On the back of the eagle, eagle flies very, very high. And uh, the little one keeps on poking to irritate the eagle. What does the eagle do? It flies very, very high. The little one cannot fly so high. Why? Because there is no pressure. The higher you go, less pressure, less, pre less oxygen. Eagle can handle that. Little one cannot handle that. Handle that. What does the eagle do? When some other bird sits on top of the eagle and pokes it to irritate it, it flies high, keeps on flying. After some time, the little one jumps off. It cannot handle the low pressure, the high, high altitude. That's the eagle handles, uh, handles a bird irritating. It doesn't fight with it. Why should it fight the Lord little bird? He flies high. And God says, about your eagle's wings, brought you to myself. You are flew, made to rise up all situations and brought you to the land of Canaan. Uh, sorry, he promised them the land of Canaan. And then, brought you to myself, he says. And then he gave them commandments when they agreed to obey the Lord. So here we find always, God com uh, uh, compares his relationship with his children like a bird looking at the young ones. Hen, chicks, Psalm 91 verse 4, under his wings, Psalm 63 verse 6, under his wings I sing, under his wings I sing, Lord, and eagle's wing carries us. So all these verses talk about God's protection upon his children, like a bird looks after the young ones, little ones. Now I come back to one more passage, where it talks about an eagle that stirs up the nest, the hose is young, Spreads wings to catch them and carry them on his pinions. This is book of Deuteronomy, 32nd chapter, verse 11. Before I come to explain this particular verse, let me share with you all the other verses I spoke about. Talk of protection, guidance, and refuge, shelter, security. But then sometimes, the mother eagle, as I mentioned in the book of Deuteronomy, 32nd chapter, verse 11, it stirs up the nest. In the nest, there are many, many little eaglets, little ones, seven, eight of them maybe. Mother eagle puts uh, uh, wings over the little ones to protect the little ones from wind, from rain, and uh, predators, other, other birds come in trying to trouble these little ones. Mother protects. Under the wings, little ones find refuge on the mother eagle's wings. Mother eagle keeps on feeding little ones, little ones, keep on, keeps on feeding them. And the eight of them, Six, seven of them eat, okay. The most obedient one is the seven, eighth one, getting very, very fat. Very obedient to the mother, sleeping, eating, never saying no to food, becoming very, very fat. What does the mother eagle do? She stirs up the nest and throws the little one out of the nest. The most fattest one, the most healthy one, is thrown out. And then the mother eagle hovers above. Little was thrown out of the nest, it become, must have been shocked initially. Why did mummy throw, threw me out of the nest? And most obedient and faithful always, always eating food, sleeping, obedient to mummy. Mummy thrown me out. The little one is thrown out of the nest. As it drops down from the nest, instinctively the wings begin to move. And it tries to remain in the air for some time. How long it remains in the air? Trying to fly depends on how much it's eaten. How much the strength is got depends on how much it's eaten. But sometimes it tries to fly. What the mother eagle doing? Hovering above the nest. Flying high, looking at the little one. The little one is struggling. After some time, it drops down. No more strength. Cannot fight gravity anymore. Falls down. Mother eagle swoops down. Picks up the little one. Puts it back in the nest. First time. Second time. Third time, fourth time, and finally, little one learns to fly. Now, the eagle is not designed to live in the mother's nest all its life. It's designed to fly. It's designed to fly. Made to flight, not for living in the mother's nest all, all its life. And as it fights gravity, 
learns to fly of some time other it waits for the wind to come the wind comes again thrown out ultimately little one flies like the mother eagle now let's come back to our situation yes we are protected shielded we are refuge under him but sometimes he goes out of the nest we have difficulties in the book of genesis chapter 15 was one very god tells abraham i am your shield your very great reward i am your shield i am your reward i protect you i am your shield but sometimes you find that the shield is not there and you face difficulties in life when that happens i am your reward because every difficulty you face because of your obedience to me is creating for you rewards in heaven the little eagle mother eagle throws the nest little one out of the nest the eagle tries to fly of some time it flies it designed to fly in the same way we are designed to live by faith christians are supposed to live by faith romans 117 as we hear the word of god faith increases little one in the nest is fed food by the mother eagle becomes fat we hear the word of god we become fat sometimes so fat we don't share that word with other people we develop constipation hearing 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 not practicing and then what does the mother eagle do throws the little one out of the nest and what does the lord do for us as we grow in faith he will refine that faith by allowing us to face trials faith come hearing the word of god romans 10:17 as we hear the word of god put to practice we face difficulties what are difficulties come now let's go back to first peter chapter 1 6 and 7 we be right about how while living in this world we have to suffer grief in all kinds of trials trials but seven says these have come that your faith of greater worth than gold which precious even though refined by fire may be proved genuine so our faith is refined through trials foundation of faith hearing god's word in faith is in jesus of course hear his word we grow in faith we put the word to practice we face difficulties the difficulties are designed to refine our faith that's why sometimes we all go through difficulties in life we got to live by faith to cause us to grow in faith increase in faith refine our faith god allows difficulties to come to us that's why the psalmist in psalm 119 when he went through affliction He writes in verse seventy-five, "In faithfulness, O Lord, you have afflicted me." The psalmist, according to Bible scholars, is supposed to be Ezra, Ezra, and he loved the word of God. He obeyed God's word because he loved God's word, and he was afflicted. He obeyed God's word, he gets afflicted. What does he say? What is the response to affliction? Verse seventy-five, "In faithfulness, O Lord, you have afflicted me. You are so faithful to me." You afflicted me. What a perspective of affliction. When people Christian go difficult, they question God. Why me, Lord? Why am I having this problem, Lord? Where is your faithfulness, Lord? You're my shield. You're my protection. You're my refuge. Why am I having this problem? God, so long you've been in the nest. Now you better learn to live by faith. Therefore, I'm allowing you to face difficulties. So this psalmist says, "You're so faithful to me, so you afflicted me." Verse ninety-two. He says. Was ninety two. If your law had not been my delight, I would have perished my affliction. The word of God was his delight. He loved the word of God. He loved to obey God's word. And says in verse one sixty five, the same psalm, and one sixty seven, great peace have they who love your law. Nothing will make them stumble. Psalm hundred nineteen was one sixty five. Two verses later, was one sixty seven. I keep your statutes. Because I love them greatly, I love your statutes. I love your word, and because I love God's word, when difficulties came because of the word, he didn't question God, but God's faithfulness. On the other hand, he is reconfirming God's faithfulness. In faithfulness, Lord, you have afflicted me. Then he goes on to say, verse seventy-one. It is good for me to be afflicted, 
that I may learn your decrees. When you go through affliction and difficulties because of obedience to God, and we have difficulties, we learn more of God. What you learn from God, we go through difficulties more lasting than what you learn from God when everything is fine. When everything is fine, He blesses us, we can forget it easily. When you go through difficulties, and God speaks to us in those difficulties, I believe me, you will not forget what He spoke. The difficult circumstances, where you seem to be down and out, insecure, troubled, and He speaks to you, you won't forget it. We spoke to you in a moment when you are down and out, when you are uh, maybe depressed or discouraged. When God speaks to you, He makes a rise above circumstances. Sometimes we go through difficulties just for that we learn of God, more of God. That's why Psalmist says, Good for me, afflicted, that we learn about you. What happened after affliction? Verse 67. Before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I obey your word. God is a shield, a protection, and today this protection in the name of Jesus. He is a security today. Let not any means be a security. Not a job, not even a family members, not a church, not a fellowship, not friends, but the Lord Jesus Christ in whom we are complete. We are given fullness in Christ. Christians chapter 2, 9 and 10. For in Christ, the fullness of the native gives, uh, lives in bodily form. And you have been given fullness in Christ, completeness in Christ. As completeness is manifested, as we go through difficulties, it doesn't happen overnight. The promise of fullness is there. Actual fullness is manifested when you go through difficulties. Fullness, abundance, maturity, all mean the same. The Greek word is teleos. T -E -L -E. I-O-U-S, teleos, which means fullness, completeness, in fact, perfection, maturity. It's the end product of a process. James chapter 1, 2, 3, 4, James writes, Consider pure joy when you face trials of many kinds. For testing your faith, there is perseverance, perseverance finishes work in you, they will be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Completeness in the end, maturity is in the end. The process includes all kinds of trials. The trials are designed to refine our faith. And therefore, let's never forget, we should make Christ our security. We articulate, Lord, I want you to be my security. You must come under his wings. Lord longs for children to come under his wings. He told the Israelites, Oh Jerusalem, how often long to bring you under my wings? But you are not willing. At the end of today's session, in your own private prayer, personal prayer, please tell God. Lord, I want you to be always my security. You are my security. Yes, you give me a family, friends, job, career. They are all wonderful gifts from you to me. But my security should be, Lord, always remind me to always have you as my security, as my confidence, as my complete hope. Now, this security is also, uh, includes obviously physical security. And the Lord spoke about protection. In, uh, when Jesus prayed to the Father in heaven, 70th chapter of John, verse 11, he says, John 17, 11, prayer of Jesus to the Father, protect them by the power of your name, the name you gave me. Who are they? Protect them with disciples. He's sending the Father in heaven. Protect them by the power of your name, the name you gave me, that name is Jesus. And therefore, he should be always our security. Protection is the name of Jesus. And therefore, thank Him for that name. In every situation, you can experience deliverance and, and freedom in that name, salvation in that name. And therefore, let Him always be our hope. Now, uh, in terms of physical security also, I told you, primarily physical security I'm talking about right now. When the Apostle Paul is ministering, there were other people along with him. And he wrote to the Thessalonians, in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 3, first two verses he talks about, Pray that the word of God spread widely and is honored by everybody. Pray that the word of God spreads widely, honored. And there are people who are going to be persecuting us, but not everybody has faith. Pray that they have faith to face their persecution. Then he goes on to say in verse 3, But the Lord is faithful. He will strengthen you and protect you from the evil one. He is faithful to strengthen you and protect you from the evil one. People may not have faith. Not everybody has the same level of faith. 
They may be faithless, but God is faithful. Second Timothy two thirteen says, "Even though we are faithless, He remains faithful, for He cannot disown Himself." Okay. Now, as far as protection is concerned, refuge, shelter, in terms of physical being, protection of the evil one, and insulated from all the things of this world, and having a confidence in Him and shelter under His wings. Now, let's come to another aspect. That is emotional insecurity. Now, uh, in the book of Hebrews, chapter six, eighteen, nineteen, uh, the writer writes about how is primarily written to the Jewish Christian. Remember that Hebrews written to uh, Christians from a Judaic background. They formerly Jews, for in Judaism they became believers. So they know the Old Testament background. He writes about how in eighteen, the nineteenth verse that uh, we are fled. To take hold of hope offered to us, we are fled to take hold of the hope offered to us. Hope is Jesus; He is our hope. First Timothy chapter one verse one says, "Jesus Christ is our hope." And here, writer says, "We are fled to take hold of hope, take hold of hope offered to us." Verse nineteen he says, "We have this hope as a anchor for the soul, firm and secure. We have this hope as an anchor for the soul." Firm and secure. Remember these words: fled, hope, anchor for the soul. Firm and secure. Okay, what do you mean of fleeing? There's a background to this. In the Old Testament time, in the Book of Numbers. Let on you read this passage, thirty-fifth chapter, verse twenty-two to twenty-eight. Numbers thirty-five, twenty-two to twenty-eight. The Levites were given cities of refuge. They were not given physical land, the land of Canaan. They were given cities of refuge. What city of refuge? When an Israelite by by unintentionally kills somebody, not intentionally, but unintentionally, unintentionally kills somebody, is wielding an axe or some uh, weapon, and by, by 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 mistake, he slips out of the hand, he kills somebody. The others, other person's family can kill him, can avenge, because those days, eye for eye, right, tooth for a tooth. They can avenge the killing, even though unintentional. They can avenge. So, what does man do? To have unintentionally kill somebody, he runs to the city of refuge. He runs. He flees to the city of refuge. Flees, and behind him comes the avenger. Family, the victim comes behind him to kill him because he killed the family. Eye for eye, tooth for a tooth, hand for a hand. So they want to take revenge. No forgiveness those days. Only revenge. This man fleeing to the city of refuge. Once he goes there, he has remained there. If he is in the city, the avenger cannot kill him. Cannot kill him because refuge, refuge is protection, security, shelter. Before sitting in the uh, city of refuge, if he gets caught by the avenger, he can be killed. Allowed. When he reaches the city of refuge, uh, city of refuge, he can't be avenged by the avenger. He will stay there. Till the high priest dies, mark that the high priest has to die. High priest dies, he is free to go wherever he wants. Once the high priest dies, he is set free. Till the high priest dies, if he comes out of the city of refuge, he can be killed. Avenger is waiting. He killed my brother. He is running away. I'll catch him. I'll kill him before he reaches the city of refuge. Once he reaches the city of refuge, he can't kill him. He is waiting outside the city of refuge. If he comes out, he is allowed to kill. But the high priest dies. After that, he is free to go wherever he wants. Nobody can touch him. Just compare that with our high priest, chief priest, ultimate high priest, Lord Jesus Christ, who died for our sins. So, like those days when they fled to the city of refuge, we have fled to this hope. We also fled from the world to Jesus, who died for us, who set us free. And therefore, we have found refuge in Him. And the writer says, "We have the hope as an anchor for the soul. Anchor means what? When a ship goes to harbor, it drops anchor. It can't move from there. That's it. Any amount of waves and storm, it will not. It is anchor, secure. Drops anchor. It can't be moved. We have the hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. Walk that one secure. Let us read Hebrews six chapter eighteen nineteen. We now understand that for the soul, yes, physical security is there, protection is there, and what about the soul? 
emotions, intellect and the will. Security for the mind, no wavering in the mind, emotional security. How many people today are emotionally insecure? You know what happens in emotions insecure? You fall in love again, 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 you fall in love. Everybody shows any attention to you, fall in love. Anybody gives attention to you, you run behind that person. There are so many people I know, emotionally insecure, hungering for love, craving for love. Someone's a little bit love, they run behind them, give them gifts and try to get back, the, uh, sustain that love. Now when you believe in Christ, ultimate love is Christ himself, who gave himself for us. Our security must be him also emotionally. The soul means what? The word soul. Zyke. Emotions, intellect and the will. All three, security for that, anchor for that is Christ. When you, when you find a security in Christ, emotions in Christ, and you, you are confident of his love, yes, of course we love people to love us. I mean, if, we say, if I say I don't like people to love me, then I am be hypocrite. But you don't crave after my human love. You don't crave after human love. You crave after God's love more and more. In that process, God will give a love of many people to us. I am so blessed today. Many people love me. Some people hate me also. They hate me some. Some love me. I don't. It doesn't matter. When they love me, I praise God. When they hate me, I praise God. Because ultimately, a security for emotion anchor should be just. Anchor for the soul, firm and secure. We have fled to this hope. Like the Israelites, just running to their hope, to the city of refuge. Behind is coming the avenger to kill him. But then he runs to hope. Once he reaches the city of refuge, he is relaxed. He is secure. Nobody can touch him. And he waits for his high priest to die. Then he is free to go wherever he wants. Today, our high priest has died for us. He has risen from the dead. We are free. So don't worry about people not loving you. Ultimate love is Christ. God's love is ultimate for us. That's enough for us. Grace is sufficient for us. It's grace. And therefore, for every aspect of our human existence, physical protection, emotional security, mental security, financial security, again, is Jesus. Because in Philippians 4.19, Paul writes, my God supply all your needs according to in Christ Jesus. My, my God supply all your needs according to riches in Christ Jesus. Financial security, the thing is basically, you do your part before God. Pay your tithes. Malachi 3.10, also confirmed in New Testament. Matthew 23, chapter 23. Matthew 23, 23. Pay your tithes. Clear your debts. Every debt you have, clear it. Roman 13.8. Pay taxes. Roman 13.7. First is tithing, Malaga 3.10, pay your taxes, Roman 13.18, uh, Roman 13.8, pay your taxes. Uh, sorry, 13.7 is pay your taxes, 13.8 is clear your debts, let no debt remain outstanding. Let no debt remain outstanding. And finally, fourth uh, uh, calling for us is to give, give generously. When you, when you do these four things, tithing, paying taxes, Clearing debts and give, you will never lack anything. You will never lack financial uh, blessings. We don't run behind finances. We run behind God. As run behind God, whatever need for us will be given to us freely. When you go through difficult times, you won't be insecure. The Apostle Paul wrote to the church in Philippi, I can do all things to him who strengthens me. Philippians 4.13. What's the context of that? Context is, at that point of time, he was actually financially not very sound. He's writing there and saying, I'm not writing them because I'm in need. I know what's have plenty, what's have been need. I could do everything him him gives me strength. At that point of time, he was financially not very sound. Earlier, he was financially sound. He said, well, I know what's have plenty, what's have been need. At this point of time, he's in need. But he's not writing to them to get money. But his security was in Christ. What did Paul do when he was rich? What did Paul do when he was poor? When he was rich, had more money than he required, he gave away. Gave away. Whatever he preached and taught, he practiced. 
He wrote to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 6 from verse 17 about handling rich people in the church. Come on those rich in the world not to be arrogant. Not to put their hope in wealth which is so uncertain but to put their hope in God who is blesses everything for enjoyment. Come on then be good to be rich in good deeds to be generous and willing to share. This way they sort of for themselves as firm part in the coming age and take hold of life with a stooly life. When Paul had plenty financially, he kept for himself, enjoyed whatever he had, and gave away, gave away. Nothing wrong enjoying wealth to the extent God wants you to enjoy. Give away the rest. What you don't need. We need God's wisdom for that. So Paul was in his rich, he generous, gave willingly, and took out life that is truly life. What did Paul do when he was poor? When he was poor, he was making many rich. 2 Corinthians 6, chapter 8 to 10 talks about the things he went through in ministry. So glory and dishonor, bad report and good report, genuine, genuine yet regards un, as, in unknown, uh, as imposters, known yet regards unknown, dying yet will live on, bitten yet not kill, sorrowful yet always rejoicing, poor yet making many rich, having nothing yet possessing everything, poor yet making many rich. When he was financially poor, he made others rich. Spiritually, when he was rich, he gave, to, gave away. So he had full confidence. I can do all things him give me strength. Because he realized his security for finance is the Lord. That's why he writes to the 19th verse, My God supply all your needs. God grows riches in Christ Jesus. Don't have any insecurity about anything. At the right time, he'll make everything beautiful. We all go through difficult times. I've gone through difficult financial times. Every aspect I'm sharing with you, I've gone through. But ultimately, he makes everything beautiful in his time. Exodus the third chapter, verse 11. God shows no favoritism. He loves all of us with infinite love. You can you imagine a parent, uh, you know, when he has little money, uh, spending on himself or herself, not giving to the child. If I have little resources, I'll give to my son, not for myself. A genuine parent will do that. How much more God? And He's unlimited. His love is unlimited. His capacity is unlimited. Unlimited capacity, unlimited love. So why can't God make us millionaires overnight? When it comes to financial insecurity, oh, I'm so badly off now. How will God provide for me? Everything belongs to Him. Haggai chapter 2 verse 8. God says, the silver is mine, the gold is mine. All the gold and silver, the whole verse, world belongs to Him. It's so difficult for him to make a millionaire's overnight. Nothing at all. But God wants us to have as much as we can handle. Ask him wisdom to handle whatever you got in an appropriate manner. And every aspect of life, physical security, emotional security, mental security, in him our mind is sound. He is a sound mind. Not a disturbed mind, not a confused mind, but a sound mind. How? Through the Holy Spirit. 2 Timothy 1.7 God will give a spirit of timidity but a power, love and sound mind. So as we put him as our security, our refuge, then everything in Psalm 91 will have confidence it will happen to us because he is a, is a faithful God even though faithless he remains faithful. But he must articulate desire, Lord, I want to be always my security, Lord. You be my security. I don't seek security from anywhere else. Anywhere else you put a security, you'll be disappointed. Job insecurity, you will really become. Don't put a trust in the, your bosses. Ultimate boss is Christ, our boss. You will live for him. So relationships, your family members, the family God gave to you, you know, he'll take care of the family. He'll give you wisdom to take care of the family. So no question insecurity in any matter. Whether physical security, emotional, mental, financial, everything, let Christ be our security. Once you're sure of his love for you, you won't clamor for human love. You will not clamor. You'll be happy with God's love. And as a bonus, God gives you also the favor of people. I'm so blessed today. So many people love me. There are more people who love me than people who hate me. But does it really matter? God loves me infinitely. Everlasting love. Jeremiah 31.3 I love you with an everlasting love. Don't you with loving kindness. Everlasting love. 
unconditional love. In second, in, sorry, in Romans chapter 8, 38, 39, Paul writes, and commits neither death nor life, neither ages nor demons, neither present nor future, any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything nor creation, can separate from the love of God and Christ Jesus. What an amazing thing. Nothing is separate from God's love. Infinite love is a personification of love. 1 John 4, 16, God is love. Personification of love. You put a refuge in him, or trust in him, security in him, you keep on receiving more and more love from God, and will now be knowing his love completely. You only know a little bit from here, in this world. And that love is so amazing. As you receive that love, manifest that love. Lord, I want to love people as you love me. The more you share God's love, the more you experience God's love. So whenever you feel a little bit insecure, you become security, uh, point people to Christ being the security, and share about Christ being the security. Be instrument of their security by pointing them to Christ. When, the point, when you point people to Christ, when they find Christ's their security, you're so happy that they've been blessed by the Lord because you shared with them who the real security is. So the whole world is full of insecure people. Look at uh, what's happening in the Middle East. Insecurity. Wars, rumors of wars, all going on. If only those people understand who Jesus is, if the Jews understand today that peace is Jesus, the security is Jesus. What did the Lord speak to Micah a long time ago? They don't believe today, these people. Micah chapter 5, verse 2. In Bethlehem, may shall be born. Verse 4. They will live securely. And he will be their peace. He is their protection. Protection is the name of Jesus. That name is a powerful name. Every day bow before that name. For everything in life depends upon him. And please articulate desire. Tell him, Lord, at the end of today's session, tell him, Lord, I want you to be my security in every aspect. Physical security, emotional security, mental security, financial security. I don't depend on anybody else. When you depend on people, the Old Testament says, they be cursed. Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 5. Cursed be a man who depends on flesh for strength. Cursed be a person who depends on flesh for strength. It depends on flesh means what? People. It depends on people. What is sometimes cursed? Today you are not cursed, but it's futile. But we'll look at verse 7. Blessed man who trusts in the Lord. But trust in people, most old the same time, you are cursed. Trust in God, you are blessed. Opposite. Blessings and curses. Thankfully, today we are not cursed and depend on people. We will be disappointed. We miss out. Why not put our entire trust in Jesus? And find out in him we have everything we need for life and godliness. Second Peter 1 3 says, His divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness. I took me a few years to put my entire trust in Jesus, security in him. Earlier I had other insecurities many years back, but for the last so many years, maybe I've 30, 40 years, uh, 30 years at least, I would say, he's been my security. He's never, ever let me down. Never let me down. People let you down. They never let you down. Psalm 94 verse 14. God will, reject, God will reject his people. He'll never forsake his inheritance. He'll not reject us. He'll never forsake his inheritance. We are God's inheritance. He's our inheritance. We're his inheritance. He longs for us. When you go to heaven, he'll say, at last you come home. Precious to God, our going home. He longs for us. Do we long for Him? We long to know Him more and more. Become more and more like Him. Anytime you feel insecure about anything, anything you feel insecure about, ask God to remind you, it's futile to be insecure about anybody, insecure about anybody or anything. It's always a blessing to ensure Christ is our security. He's our peace. Peace means oneness with God. We are one with God to Christ Jesus' blood shed by the cross and therefore we have security. And that's what God told the Israelites to Micah. They will live securely for he will be their peace. Because we have peace with God today, oneness with God. We have security in him. We are secure in him. Now what does it says in Psalm 119 verse 165? Great peace if they will love you a lot. Nothing will make them stumble. 
When you secure on God, nothing will shake you. Psalm 125 verse 1 and verse 2. Do trust in the Lord, like Mount Zion, they can't be shaken by endures forever. As the mountain surrounds Jerusalem, the Lord surrounds his people. He surrounds us, he protects us. He gives the angels in charge of us. Psalm 34 verse 7. In the Lord encounters those who fear him, he delivers them. For physical protection, he surrounds us to angels, nothing to fear. So please tell God today, even this night, Lord Jesus, you are my security. And remind me always, Lord, when I tend to feel insecure, you are my security. You will never let me down, never forsake me, never leave me. God bless you all.